What's up, Mets fans? Welcome back to the channel. And we have a great discussion we had here, folks. Myself alongside good friends Joe DeMeo and Connor Rogers that you probably know from the That's So Mets podcast. Links to all their pods in the description down below, as always, as we'll be sharing our thoughts on five New York Mets and their futures, whether they should be traded or if they should stay put in Queens. So as always, folks, make sure you stay all the way till the end video. Follow the details and all of our thoughts on these five players and what their future may be with the New York Mets or not. And of course, folks, if you find yourself enjoying this kind of Mets content and you want to see more great Mets content like this, don't hesitate from smashing that like and subscribe on sharing this video with your friends on the notification bell. All those great things. Thank you all so much for the continued support, folks. Now let's jump right into today's video. All right, guys, here we have Joe DeMeo and Connor Rogers again for the That's a Mets podcast. Thank you guys so much for chiming in. How are you guys doing? Good, man. What's going on? We're happy to be here. Uh, it was great having you on with us, so we had to jump on with you. Yeah, absolutely. Now we got to do it on my side again, which is a pleasure because, Connor, you haven't been on the channel before, right? This is your first time. This is my debut. I'm hoping to not screw this up and, and hopefully get another appearance sometimes when actual baseball is being played. Yeah, right. I know. I, I desperately want baseball back. I think we all do. And in doing so during this locket, I want to do a bunch of these different type of collaborations and topics that would really be fun to discuss. And something that's not just fun, but important to discuss is what are the Mets going to do with some players where we know that rumblings are always happy and with them trade wise. So I figured let's nar narrow them down to five here and really just share our thoughts on if we think that they should be dealt at some point, either for the right price or just for the sake of parting ways with them or to keeping them and obviously giving our stances as to why they should stay on the Mets. So without further ado, let's jump right in. So starting off at number five, this is the one prospect that we have on the list. Not that the Mets need to trade this player, but the Mets are, of course, going to do any trades of significance, and they do have to part with some top talent, not that Billy Epler wants to. There is that one prospect that sticks out because he is blocking the future from Francisco Lindor, that, of course, being a Ronnie Mauricio. So, Joe, I'm going to kind of let you take away with it, being the prospect guy here for SNY. What's your take on Ronnie Mauricio? Is he someone that you would like to see potentially dealt at the right price if he has to be that key piece to, say, landing some that can be effective for the Mets right away in the upcoming season, or maybe even going down the road at the potential trade deadline. I know it's really hard to kind of garner what makes sense for the Mets right now via trade, but what's your thoughts on all that and Ronnie and the potential impact that he will have on the Mets should he not be dealt? Honestly, I want to keep all the prospects. Uh, can, can we just keep them all? I don't want to yeah. trade any of them. But, uh, you know, obviously Ronnie's natural position is shortstop. Mm, it's it's iffy if he's going to be a shortstop at the next level anyway. So I don't think he's particularly, quote unquote, blocked. Uh, I think his probably his best position is third base, which the Mets have some other third base prospects, Brett Beatty, Mark Vientos. So I don't know if he's necessarily blocked there. So the space where Ronnie's going to fit long term with the Mets certainly would be in question. And, you know, as far as, you know, the top talents go, kind of what you were saying, if there's a big trade to be made, I mean, if they're going for a Luis Castillo or a Frankie Montas, someone with multiple years of control, that's a potential high level guy. Ronnie Mauricio is probably the best prospect I'm willing to discuss in trades. I'm not talking Brett Beatty. I'm not talking Francisco Alvarez. I'd prefer not to talk Matt Allen because I think at this point you'd be selling low on him. I agree. So much potential. And obviously he's missed so much time. But Ronnie's a guy that in an ideal world, you keep just keep building up the farm system and, you know, save for that special deal. But if that special deal is available next month or whenever this lockout ends, you know, Ronnie Mauricio is someone that I'd at least consider moving. Gotcha. All right, Connor, what's your thoughts on Mauricio? I think, you know, right when you look at the farm system and the talent that most fans know, obviously Mauricio being one from the day he signed because of his bonus, he's in a sense the most expendable of those guys. But you have to question, is anyone expendable from this farm system with how thin it is? And I know that's music to Joe's ears who wants to hold on to all these guys. And, you know, I think part of me sits here honestly and says, well, he's blocked it short from Lindor. If he, if he, ended up being a long-term shortstop which as joe alludes to might be doubtful okay you look at third base everybody's really high on Beatty, rightfully so and, and vientos is a question mark is he a long-term third baseman dh outfielder nobody knows but it's they have multiple third base prospects so is mauricio a second baseman right and then there's the flip side of assuming that third base is going to work itself out, that Beatty's a lock or Vientos is a lock. And how many times do we see that not work out in baseball? So that side is the argument to hold on to him. But with the window they've built for themselves right now, 
if it was like Joe said in a package deal for a frontline starter that is entering or is in his prime under team control for financial reasons, then it's a different conversation for me. I'm somebody that is put your foot on the gas, try to win a World Series. It's clear ownership is thought the same. So if I'm going to trade one of the top prospects, it would be Mauricio. I'm comfortable with that. I'm so glad that you brought up second base because that's something that I think a lot, not a lot of Mets fans, at least from what I've seen, I've talked about a lot. And it's a great point because especially with Jeff McNeil and his uncertainty, you know, Hinton, we'll be talking about him soon, you know, especially in a scenario where maybe you don't have a McNeil and then you maybe just have a stopgap shorter term at the second base spot. Ryan Mauricio, I do think could potentially pivot there and that might be best for his development when you look at what he is profiling so far as a shortstop. I don't think he's necessarily going to be there. Third base, again, wouldn't be a bad idea given his size as well. But when you look at the prospects that the Mets already have in Beatty, Vientos, etc., it just doesn't feel like a feasible fit for him in either of those routes right now. So, yes, I'm wholeheartedly on the same page as you guys. I'm not in favor of just trading Mauricio for the sake of trading him. I think that would be such a foolish thing. Yes, I know he has a lot of raw talent. And yes, I know that he is still pretty swing and miss right now. But he's shown a lot of upside over these past couple of years in my mind. And someone that rightfully so is a top by prospect for the New York Mets. So you don't want to just give him away for nothing. So something of a package deal, something of significance, like a frontline starter, like something that really can come in and benefit the Mets right away is something that I'm willing to do as a fan's perspective. But again, the Mets, they're going to be very reluctant to part with their prospects and for good reason right now, at least until they get to the draft where they should hopefully have a great draft upcoming in the summer. But if you look at Mauricio's numbers, again, split time in, in um, A plus and double A this past season in total, had a very solid year for the most part with a 248 average, a 296 on base, a 449 slugging. That also included 20 bombs, 64 RBIs, and 26 walks. So, you know, nothing terrible. Again, over 100 strikeouts. But point being is that Mauricio has a lot of raw talent as someone that I would love to keep in the Mets organization. The biggest question mark is how are you going to do it? I don't know how they're going to do it in the near future. And for a win now team, it does make sense why you would part someone like him over the other, the untouchables, if you will, Alvarez, Beatty, Allen, etc. So yeah, no, all great points, guys. But uh, also, great trend. Keep an uh, eye on out. Keep an eye on the outfield. That's another position they're considering giving him some looks at. So keep an eye on the outfield, with Bonnie Mauricio. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely see Mauricio toyed in the corner. Uh, I feel like they've been trying to do that with everyone, right? Just to give everyone versatility, especially when I think Mauricio honestly makes the most sense to do that, knowing that he is that guy that is blocked the most right now, at least in my opinion. You know, even someone like Beatty, who I know has been toyed with in the corner outfield, is that isn't necessarily something that needs to be nearly as prioritized as potentially someone like Mauricio, because again, it's not like that as of as we talk right now, the Mets have a third baseman locked down for the next decade, the way that they do with Lindor at short. Um, but okay, so now gain on to number four of trade or stay. Uh, we have a pitcher, and this is someone that, again, does not need to be dealt by the Mets, but is a really intriguing option. Someone that I've discussed in the past, that being in Southpaw, David Pearson, because Pearson is someone where his future is really unknown. Dealt with his injuries down the stretch this past season, unfortunately, and there's uncertainties as of now with him healthy. I'd say he's on the outside looking in for the Mets rotation. And depending on how much depth that they add on, especially if it's going to be multi, uh, multi-year multi deals, what are you going to do with Pearson? Do you want to have him as a long arm? Do you just want him for the depth? Or is he someone that, again, young, controllable, not a free agent until 2025 that you can utilize as a key piece as an MLB level player via trade? So, Joe, going back to you, what's your stance on David Pearson? He's, is he someone that you'd be willing to give up or someone that you prefer that the Mets hang on to at all costs potentially. I'm not looking to trade David Peterson. Uh, in, in my opinion, I mean, we saw it last year. How many times did you watch Jared Eikhoff start games? You watched yep. Corey Oswalt start games. The Mets are going to add another starting pitcher when this lockout ends, whether that's a high profile guy, like we talked about a minute ago, whether that's just an innings guy, like a, you say Kikuchi, like they're going to add something that's going to solidify the one through five, that you want to have on opening day, but you can have a shortened spring training, which who knows what that will mean to all of the pitchers health uh, to be able to get through a spring training. And just all the guys, you need to have that depth. It's absolutely imperative. You need to be eight, nine, 10 deep with guys that you're willing to throw out there and you know actually rely on to make at least a couple starts. And David Pearson's a guy with minor league options left. He's still talented. He had a tough year, obviously, and he had the injury. But you take David Peterson, you throw him in AAA. Like my dream scenario right now is they get one more starter and David Peterson and 
Tyler McGill are the one and two starters in AAA Syracuse. And you had a couple more guys on minor league deals and then guys like Adam Aller and Jose Buteau who got added to the 40 man roster this off season. Like that becomes your starting pitching depth. So I would, I would be very reluctant to part with Peterson. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm with you all the way, Joe. And you look at Peterson right now, one, he has no value. Two, this is somebody that they drafted in the first round. And when he came up in 2020 in the shortened season, I mean, he looked good, right? And then obviously things did not work out last year. So I wouldn't sell low at this point on top of the fact that we learned the hard way last year how quickly arms can evaporate and go on the on the you know the IL. So when you look at it from that perspective, I just don't think there's enough to gain. Like with Mauricio, there are actually avenues that you understand the gain in trading him. But with Peterson, in my opinion, you're not getting any value back. And you don't I mean, I know it's a low percent chance probably in a lot of Mets fans eyes, uh, but there is a chance that he bounces back this year and is an effective guy that pitches around a four ERA and eats some innings for you. Yeah, I think you both hit the nail on the head. He's, again, not someone that really makes sense for the Mets to part with, especially with Billy Epler emphasizing how important depth is. Like, I know I I felt this way. I'm not sure how you guys did. Last offseason when the Mets made all these moves, and it felt like that they had more than enough pitching depth, that proved to be the farthest thing from the truth, right? So if you can keep someone like Pearson, I say you absolutely do it. I will say I am completely open-minded to partying with them if it means that he is, say, one of multiple pieces yeah. to land something big. And I think all of us Mets fans can agree. Everyone has a price at the end of the day. I think Pearson falls in that category. I will counter a little bit to what you said, Connor. However, I do believe he does have value. Maybe not to an extent, of course, like a Mauricio or anyone like that, but knowing that he's not a free agent until not even 2025, I misspoke, 2026. Six, mm -hmm. and has proven to be at least somewhat effective especially in his rookie year in that short stint in 2020 came out guns and blazing surprised everyone going all the way from double a right to the bigs for the Mets so I do think that there is some value there not alone however someone that you would want to be as part of a package if anything but everyone has their price for sure Pearson is definitely someone that I would be beyond reluctant to part with in himself but as something bigger i'm of course going to be open-minded um but yeah i really agree with both of you for the most part there just did want to mention david pearson's numbers um and pearson this past season uh again didn't play too much because of injuries when had 66.2 innings pitch but had a five and a half year array again his rookie year had right around a three and a half year array uh you know k per nine was an just under 10, 9.32. The walks were a little up, though. That was the biggest thing with Pearson. He gave me some Steven Matz vibes at times. It felt like you couldn't get out of the first and he wasn't going to have a game at all. I don't know what is with the Mets and lefties and having this issue, but unfortunately, it's held true for a little bit. So we'll see how Pearson develops. He's still so young. I'm not concerned by him. I just don't exactly know what his ceiling is and how long term he'll stay in the Mets organization. But going now to Dom Smith at number three, he's a huge wild card on what his future is going to be. So, Joe, take it away. What's your thoughts on Dom Smith? Do you prefer the Mets keep him or is he someone that you actually think makes most sense to part with? I think Dom Smith is probably the most prime trade candidate of the people that we're going to talk about. I know who we're talking about after this, but I think Dom makes the most sense to be moved. Um, at this point, I just, I don't see him being enough of a hitter to be the designated hitter, at least on a consistent level. Like, I don't think Dom, I, I just don't think the bat is fully there. Like he obviously had some success, but it's not all there for me offensively. He's a really good defensive first baseman. Pete Alonso is not comfortable being the designator, de designated hitter, at least on a near full-time basis. He's willing to, you know, do it in, you know, moments or whatever. But Dom's a first baseman. He tried really hard in left field. He's not a left fielder. Like, to me, Dom's just a very, just a peculiar fit on this roster where we stand today. And I think he's a guy that makes a lot of sense, especially if you're talking trade with Oakland, like very specifically them. Matt Olson's getting traded somewhere when this lockout ends. Yankees, Braves, somewhere. Matt Olson's going to be off that roster. Dom Smith, California kid, he screams Oakland A to me. And I could just see him going there, taking over for Matt Olson on the cheap. You know, obviously Olson's going to cost much more uh, in dollars and then prospects. But you could use Dom Smith as a major league piece to bring back a Sean Manaya or a Chris Bassett. Maybe not a Montas, because I think Montas would take a real haul with that extra year of control. Agreed. But if you're looking for a lefty like Sean Manaya to plug in rotation, 
maybe it's Dom Smith and a piece or two, and that brings him home. Yeah, I just wonder, right, what, you know, what is Dom's role on this team is the biggest question mark right now. When you look at the Mets right now, they are a team that if you're going to talk about the lineup, the one area they can improve on is I think they need a little bit more pop, to be honest with you. And then I look at Dom and go, I'd say the biggest question I have about Dom over the long term is for the positions he plays, either first base or you try him in corner out, additional first baseman will the you know, 18 to 20 home run projection ever get to 25 to 30. And I comfortably say that he's just not that guy. And then when you look at the Mets, yes, you have Pete there, which is a totally different variable in all of this. It's just really tough to figure out where Dom's role is on this team. And it, you can't sit there and go, well, once in a while, you know, Pete will DH and he'll, he'll fill in there. And and then late in the game, he could be a defensive replacement. One, I don't think Pete likes that. And, and Pete's no, not, team's a team doesn't. first guy. But rightfully so, I think he's earned not enjoying that. He doesn't want to be taken out of the game in the ninth inning when you're closing out wins. So as much as I I like Dom, we all like Dom, I think this is a case where it's probably their most tradable piece because one, he's underproduced for them as a whole. And two, he just doesn't fit this the construction of this roster right now. Yeah, I mean, it, it's so frustrating when I look at Dom because he's someone that, of course, I don't want to see really any of these guys go, to be quite honest with you, but especially him, his development has been so bizarre because especially earlier years with the Mets, he had his struggles trying to get adjusted. And then, of course, what really helped him was his sleeping issue. He got that resolved, and you saw him not just lose weight, but he just was becoming a better player. And to see the sample sizes in his age 24 and 25 season, you know, he had himself just under 150 games played during that span and in the 2019 year he had himself slugging wise 525 and a 282 average with 355 on base and then in 2020 the shortened campaign again this is still dealing with juice balls so you have to keep that yeah. as a factor as well he had 616 slugging to uh 316 average 377 on base outside of michael conforto which is kind of funny considering that those two had such down years looking back they were the most dominant hitters for the Mets in the short in 2020 campaign. Then we fast forward to now, and something that's even more frustrating to evaluate Dom on is the fact that, one, he's only 26. He still has control until 2025, and he's someone that is first full year in the Mets lineup. You know, 100-plus games, he was in 145 just under 500 play appearances he was injured for like the majority of the season mm. so and we're going to talk about jd davis same exact thing too so it's really hard to view someone like him when i feel like we clearly still have not gotten the best of him i do think that he's someone that will thrive elsewhere but as you said array both of you when you look at the mets lineup right now and the stage that they're in they don't have time to potentially have dom in and get plenty of um play appearances especially in a dh that's probably going to be loaded by other options and he doesn't have that defensive versatility, unfortunately. You know, he is a liability in left field. You know, let's not sugarcoat it. Yes, he had some nice, fun grabs at times, but they were more luck than they were skill. Again, this is not to, you know, slight Dom. This is just a fact right now. So when you look at his value to the team and what makes sense via trade, I do agree. I think Dom is towards the top of that list of guys that just makes perfect sense to part with. Not by themselves. I think that would be a little foolish just because you're probably not getting much back. But he's definitely someone that I would want to pair with multiple other assets to make something of somewhat significant happen. Dom, again, love the guy. I do think he's going to thrive elsewhere. And I do think that he's going to have a bounce back here next year. But when you have Pete Alonzo locking down first base as it is, do you really want to put that much commitment into, yes, I know he's a lefty bat that can come in as a defensive replacement, but is that something that you solely want to give for a bench role? I wouldn't mind it for the Mets, but I definitely feel that they could also upgrade in that area should they wish, and I kind of expect them to. Uh, getting on now to number two, I believe we're at, uh, right? Number two? Yeah. Uh, okay, we got J.D. Davis. J.D. Davis is, you know, the biggest... By no means to see an elf in the room. We all know the story with J.D. Davis by now. I feel like ever since really got in a full role with the Mets, there's been uncertainties on his future. Just like Dom as well, he's controllable. He's not a free agent until 2025. Still in the prime of his career. Had an awfully similar year to a lot of the Mets hitters, including Dom, where they dealt with injuries all year. But the biggest thing for J.D. was his hand. You know, to have thumb issues, to have hand issues all year. That's not an easy thing to come back from when you're a hitter. And for him to still hit the way he did, pushing, you know, right around 300, was actually insane so let's start with you joe what's your take on jd davis do you think that the mets should keep him or do you think that they should part with him so connor and i have talked about this ad nauseum like i'm oh, sure yeah. you have on, on the that's so mets podcast and the that's so mets youtube channel 
And I have recently, and I say recently as in like the last few days, I was, I have a Google sheet where I have like the Mets 40 man roster laid out their whole payroll situation, prospects, coaching staff. So that way, whenever I need to talk about something, I just have it right there. I think I want to keep JD Davis now. Like, I don't think I want to trade him. I think when you look at the way this bench is set up, there is no power on this bench whatsoever. If you need a big, you know, extra base hit or a home run late in game, like is Luis Guillorme coming up and giving that to you? Or like a Nick Plummer or a Khalil Lee? Like, you're not counting on those guys. JD's defensive versatility is obviously a problem. Doesn't really have much of a position. Uh, you know, you could stick him at third base for a day and he's not good, but he's unlikely to really kill you. And the DH seemingly coming, he can maybe split some time at DH because clearly, I mean, it, it didn't feel like he hit as good as he did in 2021. Like it felt like he was never getting hits, but somehow he bad 300, had a little pop here and there. I think JD's a keep at this point. I just don't know. Like, what are you going to get for JD Davis on the market that is worth just sending him away for the sake of doing so? Like, I think get his hand, his thumb, get that healthy. I think he'd be an impactful bat off the bench, which is going to be valuable to a team like the Mets. Like, you have to be careful about just getting rid of, you know, we talked about pitching depth. You don't want to get rid of all of your offensive depth as well, because the minor leagues, there's just as little ready to come up in AAA for hitters as there is for pitchers. Yeah, I think that's it, is that as we sit here and have this discussion during the lockout, there's no way you just go, just trade J.D. Davis just to trade him, because the power, once again, the power situation on this team is one of my top concerns, and the fact is, now a guy that does not have a position, he's not effective in my eyes in the outfield, he's not effective at third base, there is a place for him to play once in a while to get four at bats in a night. When, because when, I mean, when JD Davis is healthy, he's shown he can rake. And let's be real, we all know he he was not even close to healthy last year. That is not. And yeah, the batting average is nice, but the the power was completely zapped. And that's just it's not who he is. It's not the guy in 2019 that hit 22 home runs. And maybe that's not who he is at full time. But he is somebody, in my opinion in a you know some kind of role some kind of bench role can give you double digit home runs can hit you 12 to 15 key home runs so would i like the mets to go out and explore better solutions for their bench or for their dh spot yes if the market passes them by when the lockout ends and they decide to allocate time and assets to pitching instead and they weren't able to find that kind of guy and i'm not even saying just kyle schwarber but even options that are lesser than him and they don't get that guy, then why would you trade J.D. Davis, right? And I, I think it's an absolute variable that he might not be good next year. There's no denying that. I'm not saying he's going to be the 2019 version, but the way the roster is constructed right now, they need an external upgrade before they even have the combo of moving him. I think J.D. Davis is in such a bizarre spot because if it, I think if Robinson Cano wasn't here right now, it would be a little bit more Another of a different problem. discussion. because. Yeah. Again, the reason why we're not even talking about him right now is his contract status. Again, that's something that a lot of us Mets fans hope that he will be parted with, but the likelihood may be slimmer. You know, I really does feel that way. I feel like the only way to really part with Cano is if you eat that contract. So it's different with JD and Dom. These are two guys that don't have really much versatility when it comes to being, you know, athletic in the infield or the outfield to this point to be effective for the Mets. And when you have not just two, but three adding with Robinson Cano, like let's be honest here, those are three guys that profile best as a DH. You can't have three DHs on your bench to have success for a team that Billy Upper wants to be as versatile as possible. So it's not going to add up. And JD's in such a weird spot, just like Dom, where down here because of injuries is slugging just completely down again. It's really insane how he goes from in 2019. Again, of course, juice ball era, but that was his coming out party. With the Mets, you know, 527 slugging, a 307 average, a 369 on base. 2020 had a down year for the most part, 247, 371, still high on base, I should say, but a 389 slugging and actually did go up there a little bit in slugging. So I'm contradicting myself a little bit with 436, 285 average, and a 384 on base. So offensively, the numbers don't look terrible, but home runs five in 73 games, six and 56 um, the year prior. So He's someone that's really hard to gauge exactly how he would fit on the Mets right now because one, the biggest sample size we saw was in 2019 and the Mets are proving this offseason that 
they're not going to be banking on those 2019 yeah. performances any year. Like it's just, uh, I understood it going into this past season, but you can't justify it now heading into 2022. Like it just can't be done given not just the juice falls, but also the statuses of those players at the time and the roster. So JD is someone that I'm in more favor of partying with than keeping for the sole reason that one, you don't have any defensive ability with him whatsoever at this point. And two, he's just someone that I truly feel is almost inevitable to be part with as he said it himself, that he thinks that there's a stronger chance than not that he's gone this off season. So for him to say that himself, you can kind of get that vibe. There's certain players that you kind of have that understanding that you think that they're going to be gone. I think JD is literally the number one guy on that list. Not that I dislike him for, uh, you know, his offensive production, of course, and what he brings, but just someone that I do feel is kind of inevitable that his time in Queens are done. Again, we'll see. I think that power bat DH wise, he profiles so well, but he's not the only one that could be a very realistic DH fit. And there are other, and there are potentially other DH fits that might bring you more defensive upside than someone like him. So it's really tough, but I do think that JD is more so on my, you know, trade than stay list personally, but I understand your stances for sure. And I think that's a great pivot now into number one, you know, the man of the hour, the guy that has taken over the off season uh, with little to no other news going on that being Jeff McNeil, what's his future going to be right? Talking about versatility. That is your guy for what the Mets are looking for. McNeil does check off all those boxes. So to see these rumors, these these ideas of him potentially being part with it goes beyond his performance obviously it goes on with the locker room situation not that it solely does but that's definitely a factor so joe what's your take on jeff mcneil is he someone that you think that the mets absolutely should keep or is he someone that you think may very well be part with and for good reason at the end of the day keep 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 do not trade jeff mcneil don't trade jeff mcneil all you have to do pull up his little baseball reference page and look at what Jeff McNeil has done for his entire career outside of this year. Dealt with some injury stuff, Connor. You had talked about that on our podcast. And I think Jeff McNeil's just a hitter, man. And obviously he had the issues with Francisco Lindor. They had the whole rat raccoon thing and whatever happened, happened there. The reality is, what did I hire Buck Showalter for? Like he's here to Boy. fix this culture, fix this locker room, fix the clubhouse and Buck Walter needs to have a conversation with Jeff McNeil when he's allowed to and say Jeff this is what we're doing we need to know if you are bought in or if you're not and I think Buck is a guy that could get through to McNeil and then you take his approach and get him back to the approach that he's had over the last three years prior to 2021 I mean Jeff we forget that Jeff McNeil was like a four or five win player that made the all-star team like He's not just a solid guy. And the versatility is huge, like you said. If there's a day where Robinson Cano is going to play second base, McNeil could play left that day or McNeil could play third because guys are going to get days off. You're going to need to play guys at different spots. And Jeff McNeil is a guy that you could play all over the diamond. He can hit. To me, I don't see any logic whatsoever in trading Jeff McNeil. So this is the player that on on that so Mets Joe and I have really predicted as the bounce back guy, right? We, sure, JD and you know everybody's had their injuries, but with Dom, there's real concern. With JD, there's always real concern, especially without having a position. At least Dom gives you a good glove at first base when you need him there. With McNeil, though, why we've stood behind him as the bounce back guy and as the don't move guy is the fact that there's a sample size there of the kind of player he is. And this is a team that needs that kind of player. Even out after going out and getting Marte and Canna, and, you know, and hopefully Nemo can stay healthy, they need somebody that can put the bat to the ball. And and, and hopefully McNeil gets back to being that guy, right? There, we it's well documented he gets home run happy when he gets in the groove of hitting home runs. But when McNeil really dials it back in, and I don't want to say slaps at the ball, but turns into a more contact hitter. He could be in the conversation for a batting title. That's the kind of hitter he is. Now, what I'll say, and Joe's spot on, that why is Buck here if he's not fixing issues like this? But if they know internally a lot more than we do, which they do, that McNeil is not salvageable, he's not a team guy, he doesn't get along with multiple people in the clubhouse, then this is not correctable in my eyes. And it, that sucks. That's the worst. Then you have to trade him and you're not going to get the return that you wanted back for him. And But you can't go into the season with a guy like that. This team, and, and the reason is, and I have been a big Jeff McNeil fan for a long time. I like the passion he plays with, but to a certain degree, this year with Max Scherzer there, Marte, Canna, Escobar, 
that BS is not going to fly in that clubhouse. There are guys that are going to, not like Lindor, that almost had to apparently beat him up. There are guys that are vets even older than Lindor that will say, we have bigger goals than your temper tantrums or not shifting or being angry all the time. And it, if McNeil can put those things aside, he can be a great player for this team, an impactful player for this team. But if he can't, then unfortunately this conversation does end that you have to trade him. So we truly don't know the answer to this question, which makes him the most interesting one. Yeah, it's so hard to evaluate what McNeil's future is going to be based on that alone, right? If there wasn't a supposed potentially attitude issue, then I don't even think that this is warranted of having discussion. I don't even think that rumors come up. And don't get me wrong, I will be surprised if McNeil is traded and the main reason why is not his performance. I will be a little surprised by that. I think that they go in hand with each other. But more than anything, from what we've seen, it seems like that if the Mets are going to go down the route of dealing him, it's because of what they can really get in return. Because when you look at the players available, that are on the current roster there's no one that has more value than mcneil and i know you might be saying oh he had a down year yes he did but teams that would be looking at mcneil's market are not viewing him on 2021 they're doing the same thing that they would going after any free agent per se where you're buying in on the future what are you expecting from him in years going forward not what he's done at this point what he's going to continue doing mcneil is a thousand percent a bass back candidate i fully expect him to get back to that 300 average type hitter that he's career 299 as we speak and again he dealt with so many injuries that hamstring seemed like it nagged him for the majority of the year. That's how I feel about Conforto too. And that's what makes it even that much more difficult to evaluate these guys via trade. What makes most sense? Cause all of them had down years directly in part with injuries. If that wasn't the case and they just completely slumped, then it's a different discussion, but that isn't. So there's all these different factors that go into should the Mets keep or should the Mets trade these players? Why are they in these rumblings? And McNeil is someone that, if it really is an attitude issue to your point where it goes beyond what the fans to this point know, then yeah, that is something that you have to make sure that you get rid of that clubhouse cancer. I really hope that isn't the case. I don't think it's the case, but if that is, then that's something that goes beyond, you know, our personal preference of just wanting a great talent. You need to make sure that everything gels well in the clubhouse. They have their fair share of issues that really try to get swept under the rug that became more apparent, especially postseason this past year for the Mets. So He's a huge wild card. I do not want to see McNeil go. go. I think it would be foolish for the Mets to part with him because you have an automatic hole at second base. But what I will say is that if the Mets do trade Jeff McNeil, I will be pretty confident in that, knowing that it's probably one as part of something significant. And two, they're not going to part with McNeil without having an infield replacement, whether that's shifting Escobar to second and having a new signing or trade at third or however they want to go about things. Mets are going to be smart. So I'm going to trust in Billy Epler, Steve Cohen, and everything that they're doing there but yeah on the forefront from what we know at this point no by no means do i want to part with jeff mcneil i really think that you'd have to be fool to want that but again that's neither here nor there we're going to see exactly what more details come up if at all and what leads to his future once the lockout is lifted heading into the season um any final comments on mcneil and all the players as a whole guys yeah, for me, I mean, it's just with McNeil, there's no, Connor made a fantastic point. Like there's no baseball reason to trade Jeff McNeil. That reason does not exist. However, if it's a situation in the clubhouse that cannot be fixed, like the, the Lindor thing, like, was that just a dust up or is it a big, if it's a big problem, I mean, you know, that's something you can't have. The reality is like Max Scherzer's not going to stand for that. Max Scherzer is going to make such a difference in this clubhouse that I don't think people quite realize. Um, so, yeah, I think for me, it's it's going to be very interesting to see once this lockout ends, how much trade action do the Mets actually do? Because they have these guys that we talked about and maybe some others that they consider moving. Is, is there going to be much trade activity or are they just going to go into free agency for the most part and say, you know, we're going to go get our starter in free agency. We'll sign two relievers in free agency. We'll sign bench players in free agency and then mostly keep their guys. Or conversely, are they going to take on someone's contract? I know where do you put out a video about Josh Donaldson, but like, you know, are they going to take someone's contract to get additional prospect capital? Like, is that the trade route that they're going to go rather than selling their pieces to buy do they just take something off someone's hands and then kind of buy prospects from them it's gonna be fascinating to see what billy epler opts to do in the next month or whenever yeah i second that I i'm fascinated to see how creative he can get with almost unlimited resources in a sense in terms of where you know in entering this job the fact that they know they have to build up that farm system and 
everything's focused on the major league team right now rightly so but I, i'm fascinated to see with all the draft picks they have and the trade potential that joe alluded to you know, what creative ways they do rebuild the entire organization not just the major league roster absolutely and what uh, going back to what joe said quick you know what are they going to do more frazier or trade market i think that they're going to continue to do exactly what they did pre-lockout go all in on free agency that's the easiest way to build a contender now without of course giving up your future the mets don't have great depth with their future right now so they need to make sure that they continue to work on it do i think that they will be involved in the trade market yes but they need a lot of things to go right and to have to jump all these hurdles first at the end of the day might be caused more of an issue especially if the lockout ends and we have so only so much time until say the season begins you know trying to work a trade is far more difficult for the most part than trying to do a big name signing especially when the mets can throw honestly more money than any other team could imagine as long as steve cohen is ready to go and they are prioritizing a player i really don't see a world where the mets don't land that player now depending on pitching wise yes there isn't as much depth as say the trade market you could argue that for sure um but all in all the mets are going to build through free agency and free agency first and foremost and then whatever doesn't work there is where i realistically see them maybe pivoting a little bit more in the trade market so like you both i'm beyond interested to see what billy epler and steve cohen they're going to do but all i know is that i want baseball back I want this offseason to get up and going again. Um, hopefully things get rolling because boy, oh boy, I, I just, we got to get some moves. We got to get some things going before the season begins. Well, thanks for having us, dude. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I am now very excited. I have been excited to see what they do with these players, especially the last three that we mentioned, because everybody's had their eyes on their long-term futures or lack thereof with the Mets for a while. So I'm with you all the way. I echo that statement. Let's just get this offseason back and this lockout and get baseball on time. Absolutely. Yeah. I appreciate you both guys coming on so much. It won't be the last time for sure. Everyone watching, please make sure to check out the That's So Mets podcast, wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. They just hit 1K. So congratulations, guys. You're finally there. It only took like what, not even 10 Maybe steps. Maybe so steps. You're, you're on your yeah. way out. Uh, you yeah. guys are killing it. Love the pod. I've um, been enjoying every single time you guys come out with a new one each week. So guys, please make sure to check them out again. Make sure to check out Connor and all the great stuff he's doing with Bleach Report, especially same thing with Joe and SNY. They're coming out with great content, not just for, of course, the Mets, but Connor, especially with football and all these other things. So yeah, again, thank you guys so much. Really, really appreciate it. And, you know, of course, let's go Mets.